In this video, you'll learn exactly how to process marketplace payouts using Stripe Connect without writing a single line of code in Bubble. Now Stripe Connect is the perfect tool for processing a payment in a marketplace, then taking a percentage or a cut of that transaction as the admin or owner of the marketplace itself. If you've ever used a marketplace like Etsy, Airbnb, or even Uber, this is the feature that powers those real world applications. So within this guide, I'm going to explain everything you need to know to clone that exact feature within your own app. Look, before I say another word though, I'd just love to show you a quick preview of what we're gonna be building today. Over in a preview of my application here, you can see that I'm logged into a user account and I'm currently viewing my settings page. Now in our marketplace, if this user would ever like to upgrade their account to become a seller or a merchant, they can click this text here and it's going to upgrade their account in my database. If I then scroll on down, you'll see that they have the option to create a new store as well as list what country their store is based in. Now, if I just update this information here, I'm gonna to choose to save that in my database. And what you'll also see is that this merchant also has the option to connect their own Stripe merchant account. And of course, this is essential to be able to process a payment on their behalf, take a commission from that transaction, and then send them the remaining amount. So if this user clicks on this button to connect their Stripe account, they're gonna be redirected through to a Stripe onboarding page. And on this page, the user will be required to add in all of their business information. So this is information like the business name, the address, the contact number, who's the director of the company. And of course, if a user already has an existing Stripe account, they can easily just log into that. But I'm gonna skip this boring part because I'd like to jump back into Bubble and show you how this looks once a user has actually set up their account information. Now, if I jump back into Bubble, I've logged in as another user who already has set up their Stripe merchant account. And if I scroll on down, you'll be able to see a list of all of their Stripe account information. So things like their unique merchant ID, how much they have in pending transactions and how much is available that's going to be paid out. And then if I also scroll down, you'll see that the user will have the ability to update their payout schedule. So this is the interval where they'll receive payouts from the transactions that happen on your marketplace. And right now my users just got this set to monthly, but of course you can change that to daily or weekly. But what I'm really interested in showing you today is how a transaction will look once we process that in our marketplace and take a percentage of that sale. So if I jump over to a product page, I'm currently logged in as another user once again, and let's say I wanna purchase this bamboo plant holder. I'm gonna click on this button here and choose to purchase this. It's then gonna redirect me through to a Stripe checkout page from which I'm then gonna add in my payment method. Then from here, I'm gonna to select to pay for this item. That transaction will process. Then it's just going to redirect me back to my application and confirm with me that my order has been placed. But if I was to once again, jump back to my merchant accounts settings page, I can scroll on down and I can choose to view their own Stripe dashboard. Now, when I click on this, it's gonna take me through to a dedicated page where this merchant can log into their own Stripe account. And then inside of this account, they're going to see a dashboard with all of the orders that have processed on this specific marketplace. So I can see that we got a new order that came in here. And this not only tells me how much that order was in my local currency, but also how much the fee I paid to the marketplace was. So in this case today, I was paying a 20% fee. Now look, this is just a small sample of everything I wanna cover within this video today. So at this point, I feel like I've already said enough. Let's just open up our bubble editor and I can start walking you through the process. When it comes to our tutorial today, there's so much that I wanna walk through. And so to keep track of where we are throughout the build, what I've done is I've just created this checklist that I'm going to refer to after I add each feature into our bubble editor. Now this checklist is just within my own Notion account. And what I love about Notion is that you can just tick items off as you add them into Bubble. And as you'll see, there is quite an extensive list of features that I wanna cover within our build today. And of course, I'm gonna be sure to explain each one of these features in as much detail as I can as we add it into Bubble. And look, if you'd like a copy of this checklist so you can follow along with me as we walk through the process, I'll be sure to include a link to this in the description of this video, so that way you can easily make a copy of this template. But when it comes to our list of features today, as you can see, I've broken these down into different sections, so that way things are more manageable throughout the process, as opposed to being overwhelmed with how much we need to add in. And the very first thing I just wanna cover is how we can start from scratch and create our own Stripe account. 
Now, if you're looking to process marketplace payments with Stripe, of course, you're gonna to need to have a Stripe account to do that. Now, I know some people might already have a Stripe account, but I just wanna take the time to quickly explain how you can create one and then how you can integrate it with Bubble by sourcing your own API keys. Now, over in a separate tab here, I've created a brand new Stripe account. So if you just head to stripe.com, create a new account, what you'll be required to do is add in some information about your business. And that information will differ based on the region in which you live in. So I, for instance, live in Australia, but if you were to live in the UK or the US, Stripe would require different information from you just because there's different tax laws, as well as different regional nuances that you just need to store in your Stripe account. And so I'm not gonna bore you with the details of showing you how I walked through the process of creating my own Stripe account. But one thing I will just point out is that after you create a Stripe account from scratch, you will need to just verify your email and potentially even set up multi-factor authentication with a phone number. What you'll find is that if you don't take the time to verify your account, Stripe will actually limit some of the capabilities you'll have. And so if you wanna follow my tutorial smoothly today, I'd always recommend pausing this tutorial here and just taking the time to fill in all that information. If you have successfully created a Stripe account though, you'll find that your screen looks very much the same as mine. And so now what we'll need to do is create a way to allow Stripe here to talk to our very own Bubble application. Now over in a Bubble editor, what we'll need to do is install a new plugin which is going to allow us to talk to Stripe. And so if we head to our plugins tab here, you can see I already have the plugin installed, but if you wanted to source this plugin, you just need to open up your plugins library and you're just gonna type in the word Stripe Connect. Now today we're gonna to be using the Stripe Connect Marketplace plugin built by Cranford Tech. Now there are multiple different Stripe plugins to process marketplace payments, but what I love about this particular plugin here is how simple it is to integrate it with Bubble. The developer of the plugins truly made it as easy as possible to get things up and running. And if I was to click on the plugin page here, what I do also love is that on this page, it includes a long list of all of the actions you can use this plugin for, as well as a link to an additional documentation page. And it also has a great list of bullet points to help you troubleshoot any errors you might get along the way. Now, of course, it's my job to help you with any of those issues today, but if you ever find that you have any additional questions or any errors, I'm sure you'll find the steps on this plugin page super helpful. Now, if I just jump back into my bubble editor here, I'm gonna install this plugin. Now, one thing I should point out is that this is a paid plugin. And when it comes to processing marketplace payments, any good plugin will be a paid plugin. If you find that there's things like a free plugin, you'll often find that they're a little bit more complex to work with because they might require some custom code. And so if you're familiar with coding, by all means, you can use those plugins. However, if you're someone like me who just wants the simplest solution possible, then this is the plugin I'd recommend using. So we're then gonna close our plugin library here. And after we've installed the plugin, if we just scroll down in our plugin settings here, what you'll see is that we have a series of input fields that we just need to store some information in. And this is where we're going to store our API keys. And if you're relatively new to Bubble, an API key is essentially just a way of creating a connection between your Bubble app and your Stripe account. So that way they can talk to each other and send information to and from each platform. Now, while there are plenty of great tutorials that already exist explaining how you can actually source API keys, I am still gonna take the time to just explain how you can grab these yourself, just because I wanna make sure I don't leave you hanging in any way possible. So if we were to head over to our Stripe account, I'm just gonna close this tab I no longer need beside that. But what we'll do is just open up this developers tab and you'll also see another option to open up your API keys. And this is where we can actually source those keys from. Now, if I just jump back into Bubble for a moment, you'll see there's a couple of different types of API keys we'll need. First of all, there's our publishable key, there's our secret key, and then we'll need to store the exact same information but for our development version. So there's our Stripe publishable key development, and then there's our secret key development. Now, what is the difference between these two options? Essentially, while you're building your application in a preview, so this is while you're building it before you've actually published it to a live domain, what you'll need to do is source the development API keys. And that's going to allow Stripe to process things like dummy transactions for you. So that way you can get a good idea of how Stripe's going to function without actually storing real transactions with real credit cards. But of course, once you then go to publish your application, that's when you're actually going to want to process real transactions. And so that's where you'll source your live API keys. And of course, I'm going to explain how we can source both of these. 
And so if we jump back into Stripe here, the first thing we're gonna need to grab is the publishable key. So I'm gonna to choose to copy this. I'll head over into Bubble. And if we then go to our Stripe publishable key field, I'm gonna paste this in here. It's truly as simple as that. I'll then need to grab our secret key. So if we jump into Stripe once again, what you'll see is that we're gonna to need to create a secret key. Now I've already created a series of secret keys for different tutorials that I've already built. So you won't see all of these secret keys within your own Stripe account. But what you will need to do is create a new secret key from scratch. So we're gonna to choose to create this. You will just need to verify your own Stripe account one more time. And then once you've done that, you'll be able to just give your secret key a name. Now I'm just gonna call mine Stripe Connect Tutorial Demo. But of course you can call this whatever you'd like. You can call it the same name as your application. It doesn't really matter. So we're gonna to choose to create this here. I'm then gonna to choose to copy this API key to my clipboard. I'll jump back over into our bubble editor and I'll paste that within our secret key field. And just like that, we now have two of our API keys sourced. So we'll now need to do the exact same thing, but for our development versions. So we're gonna to need to grab our publishable development key as well as our secret key in our development mode. Now, in order to source this, this is super straightforward. We're just gonna jump back into Stripe. I'll close this here. And up in the right hand side of our screen, you might see this little toggle, which is known as test mode. If I was to toggle this on, Stripe's actually gonna activate the test or development version of my Stripe account. So this is the test mode where we can actually process dummy transactions. And once again, you'll see a publishable key here as well as a secret key. So we're just gonna start by copying across our publishable key. We'll jump back into bubble. We'll paste that within our Stripe publishable key development field. And then we'll do the exact same thing for our secret key. So I'm gonna reveal my test key. I will make a copy of that. Then we can jump back into bubble and I'll paste that into this field. Now from here, there are two very last fields we'll just need to source an API key for. And that is our overall API field, as well as the same version for the development application. Now, thankfully these fields are super straightforward to source. Essentially what you'll need to do is just add in your secret key into this field but you'll just need to add a slight modification to it. And so what we're gonna do is first of all, grab our secret key for our live version. So I'm just gonna highlight all of this text. I'm gonna make a copy of that. I'm then gonna select in my API field and the modification I'm gonna to need to make is that I'm gonna to need to type in the word bearer followed by a space. Now, please just take note of how I've spelt this. There is a capital B followed by the word and then there's a space after that. And they're gonna paste in my secret API key. And this is exactly how your API should look. Now at this point, I'm sure you're probably wondering what the hell the word bearer means. And look, that is a very valid question. What the purpose of this bearer field is for is more to just authenticate that you are the owner of both the Stripe account and the Bubble application. Whereas the additional API key fields here are going to power the functionality. So every single time you say, hey Stripe, I want this information, or Stripe, I want you to process that transaction. That's what these additional APIs are for. So you can think of these as your functional APIs. So they're the things that actually do something. Whereas your overarching API key here is more of like a security layer. So it just allows you to authenticate that you are you, the owner of both applications. Now look, we're gonna need to do the exact same thing for our API key dev field. So I'm gonna select in this, I'm gonna type in the word bearer followed by a space. Only this time, I'm just gonna to need to copy in my secret key from my development version. So I'm gonna select in this field, copy all of that text, select into my API key field and paste that in. And just like that, you now have all of your API keys sourced. I'm sure you're probably sick of me saying the word API at this point, and believe me, I am too. But look, we got there in the end. Now, I know this part of the build hasn't been the most sexy thing to create, but look, this is absolute essential housekeeping in order to power the rest of our experience today. But what we're gonna do from here is just jump back into my Notion checklist, and we're just gonna tick off that we've not only finished creating our own Stripe account, but we took the time to also install the necessary plugin that we're gonna use. And then of course, we sourced our own Stripe API keys. Working my way down through the list of features within my checklist here today, the next thing I wanted to focus on was the feature that allows merchants to register as sellers within our marketplace. Now again, this is kind of like some housekeeping that we need to take care of before we can actually start processing transactions. 
But by all means, this is gonna be one of the media sections of our course today. And the reason for that is because I just wanted to take the time to explain everything in as much detail as I could. So I wanna explain how I've set up my database, how I've designed my page, how I've built out the workflows, and of course, how I've created the user experience to allow the process of someone becoming a seller as easy as possible. So what we're gonna do is jump over into a bubble application that I've already created. Now this is the same application that I've just sourced my API keys for. The only thing I've done within this app is I've just created a settings page. And on this page right now, you just see a small group which contains some input elements for a user to update their personal details. And so within this group, we're displaying just an input field to store someone's name as well as their profile photo. And perhaps before I even show you how I built out this page, I should actually take the time to explain how I've set up my database to store all of this information for a user. So if we jump into our data tab here, you'll see within my database, I have a few different data types. Now, if you've already created a marketplace and you're looking to integrate marketplace payments, your database will actually probably look similar to mine. But if you're starting from scratch, I just wanted to quickly run over some of the necessary data types and fields you'll need. So under our user data type, as I mentioned, I'm storing some basic information like the user's name, as well as their profile photo. Now on a marketplace, of course, there's two different types of users you could have. There's the buyers and then there's the sellers. So your sellers will also be known as the merchants. So you're gonna hear me mention that term quite a bit today. And you'll also see that under our user data type, I have a data field known as the account type. Now this is just linked to an option set I've created where a user can either be a buyer or a merchant. And so if you wanna see how I've created that, just under my option sets, I've created an option set called account type and I've just added in two options. So there's the buyer and the merchant. Now by default, whenever someone registers an account, I'd actually like them to be a buyer, not a merchant. So we're gonna update this here today. And the reason for that is because whenever someone creates an account in my marketplace, I would like to assume that they're interested in buying something, but it's only when they choose to upgrade their account to become a merchant that they should actually have access to sell things. And so if we set the default value to be a buyer, when their account is created, they will be a buyer. Now you'll also notice two additional data fields I have here. One is known as the owned shop. Now this is linked to a separate data type, which I'll show you in a moment but the other is the Stripe account ID. Now this account ID is the data we're going to create and store within this module of our course. So when a user upgrades their account to become a merchant, I'd like to link their Stripe account to ours. So that way when we process a transaction, I can not only take my percentage of the sale, but I can then also send them the funds that they're entitled to. So this is how I've set up my user data type. Now, of course, if a user is a merchant in our platform, they're most likely gonna need to create a shop. And so if you were creating a marketplace similar to something like Etsy, every user can create their own little store within the overall marketplace itself. And for that information of the shop, I'm gonna be storing two particular fields. There's just the name of the shop, and then there's the country code of the shop. Now, of course, within your marketplace, you're probably storing more information about a shop. You could be storing things like a logo, a bio of the shop, as well as any other information you'd like. But I'm gonna keep ours fairly straightforward for the sake of our tutorial. One thing I will just point out is that I have stored this store country code for a reason. We're gonna use that in a moment when we actually determine where we're gonna be processing a transaction in Stripe. So is the user based in the US? Are they based in Australia? Are they based in Europe? This will come into play later on. So this is a field you will need to pay attention to. Now for every shop that is created, a user could of course create and list products within that shop. So for every product, I'm just gonna store some basic information like a description, a featured image, a price, a title of the product. That's all fairly straightforward. But I also have this field that links this product back to an original shop. So I'm just abbreviating that as OG shop. And you'll see that that is linked to my shop data type. And then finally, we have one last data type, which is known as our order. So every single time someone creates or processes a transaction in our application, I wanna create an entry in my database to store some information about that. So for every order, I of course wanna list what products were included within that order. I'd also like to store the total amount of that order. So that is the dollar value. But there's two additional fields you'll see here that are linked to my Stripe integration today. And the first one I should point out is the seller ID. And so the seller ID will just allow me to determine who the merchant was that sold a product. 
So if you were buying something from my store, I would be the merchant. So I would want to store my seller ID. And then there's another field known as the payment intent ID. And I'm going to reference that in a moment, but essentially the payment intent ID just allows you to track a transaction because when someone wants to actually process a payment, they have intent to purchase something. But as you would know, not every transaction is guaranteed to go through. And so if that transaction was to fail for some reason, and look, that could be that the user doesn't have sufficient funds on their card, or perhaps they just changed their mind at the last minute. What we can actually do is store an ID for that payment intent. So that way we can track that transaction in our own Stripe dashboard. Now, of course, your data type for your order might be different. You might have a whole suite of additional data fields, and that is perfectly fine. But these are the essential data fields I'm going to reference within my tutorial today. And so that just summarizes my entire database that I built from scratch. Now, as we wrap up the process of building out our database, there is one very last thing I just want to cover. And that is how we need to set up a privacy rule under our user data type. Now, this is due to a recent change that Bubbles made to privacy settings when you're working with APIs. So you will need to follow what I'm about to teach you. And of course, if you're not familiar with privacy settings, please don't stress. This is a super straightforward process. So under my user data type, you can see that this is listed as publicly visible. So right now I do not have a privacy setting by default. What you will find though, is that whenever you create a bubble application from scratch, you will have a default privacy rule under your user data type. And that privacy rule will only allow users to see data that they create. So if I was to replicate this from scratch, I create a new rule and this is called users own data. Now, the reason I know what this is called is because once again, when you create a brand new application from scratch, this is the name of the privacy rule that bubble applies. So I'm going to choose to create this. And I know that when you create a brand new application from scratch, the condition on the privacy rule just recognizes when this user is the current user. So that means that a user can see all of their own data. What you will then see is that we have all of these additional data fields that just allow everyone else who is not the current user to view that information. And of course, under our user data type, we have this field known as the Stripe account ID. And so it's at this point that we're just going to need to tick this box here. So that way in our marketplace, our Stripe account ID can be accessible to anyone. So if we're buying something off another merchant, we can access their Stripe account ID to process that sale. Now, as I mentioned, this step in our instructions is 100% necessary. If you want to be able to connect to an API, you do need to follow these steps. Now, look, I'm not going to ramble on about this for any longer because what I'd like to do from here is jump back into my design tab and I want to walk you through an experience I've created today that allows us to not only store the information about a user, but also allows them to upgrade from a regular user account to an account that allows them to become a merchant in our marketplace so that way they can start listing products for sale. And now the reason why I just wanted to explain this in detail is so if you would like, you can replicate the same user experience. So on my settings page here, I have a group, which if I double click on this, this is known as the group personal settings. So within this group, I'm just storing some information about the user themselves. So as I alluded to before, whenever a user creates an account by default, they are a buyer. So we'll need to just store some information about their buyer. So their name and their profile photo. Now, if they were to click on this button, we could of course run a workflow and make changes to that user's details in our database. And of course, just update their name and their profile photo. But what you might also notice is that below that button, I have this text element, which refers to the text upgrade to become a seller. So if a user would ever like to upgrade their account to become a merchant, they could click on this text here. Now what I've done is I've already created a workflow and I just want to quickly walk you through the step within this workflow. It's a super straightforward process. All I'm doing is just making changes to a thing. That thing is the current user. And in this case, I'm updating their account type from a buyer to now become a merchant. And that is all I'll need to change here. What I then did within my design tab is if I just close this property editor, I've actually added an additional group on my page, which is currently hidden by default. So if I head up to my elements tree, I'm going to display my group seller settings. And so if I click on this, this is going to be the group that displays all of the information about a user's store. And look today, I'm only just storing some basic information. So things like the store name, as well as the store country code. Now, once again, the reason I'm storing a country code is because we will need this information when we create a user Stripe account or when we link their existing Stripe account. And when it comes to our country code, what I've done is I've added in a list of static values. 
And if you wanted to add in all of these country codes, what I've actually done within my Notion checklist is I've included a link here, which if you click this, it's just gonna take you through to a list of all of the country codes you'll need. So you can add in whatever countries you wanna support. It's a pretty straightforward process, but I'm just gonna close that for now because I just wanna highlight that with this second group here, if I open up my layout tab, as you'll see, this element is not visible on my page load and it's going to be collapsed when it's hidden. Now, the reason why I'm not displaying it by default is because I only want this group to be displayed to users who are merchants within my application. So I've also gone ahead and I've created a condition that only allows this to be displayed when the current user's account type is in fact a merchant. And so if I was to just quickly show you an example of how this whole experience is going to function, I'm just gonna open up my data tab here, head to my app data, and I'm just gonna run a preview of a user who is currently a buyer, as you can see. So I'm gonna run this here. And as you can see within my preview, because my user is just registered as a buyer, not a merchant, I don't see the second group on my page. However, if I was to click this text and upgrade this account to become a seller, I now have access to view this group. And within that, you may also notice this red group. And this is where things are going to get interesting. So if I just jump back into Bubble, within my second group here, in my elements tree, you'll notice that I have two additional groups that are nested inside of this. Now for the sake of our tutorial, I've just set the background color of these groups to be red, so that way you can clearly see where they sit on my page. And what you'll see within our first group is that we're prompting a user to connect their own Stripe merchant account. And so this is where we're gonna build out the very first workflow that integrates with our Stripe plugin. Now, again, one thing I should just quickly point out is that by default, if I head to my layout tab, this group is not visible on my page load. And I've set that this should collapse when it's hidden. Now, the reason for that is because if a user is going to connect a new Stripe account, I only want this group to be displayed if they have not already yet connected an account. And of course, once they do connect their account, I don't want this to be visible anymore because by that point they have already connected it, as I just mentioned. So in my conditional tab, what I've done is I've created a condition and I've just recognized when the current user, when their Stripe account ID, so that is their merchant ID within Stripe, in our database, when it is empty, so when it doesn't have a value stored in it, I'd like this group to become visible. And it's now at this point that we can select on our connect account button, head to our appearance tab, and we're gonna build out the workflow that allows us to integrate their Stripe account with our own application. So I'm gonna to choose to add a workflow here. And within this workflow, there's gonna be a few different steps that we need to add. If we open up our actions menu and head down to our plugin triggers, we're gonna select this option to create an express account. So this is going to allow that merchant to create a new Stripe Connect account that they can link to our marketplace. And of course, if they already have an existing Stripe Connect account, they can easily just log into that and link that itself. Now, as you'll see, there's a couple of different mandatory fields that we just need to integrate. And the very first thing is going to be the country code. Now, if you'd like, you can store this as a static value. So for instance, if you have a marketplace in the US and you're only servicing US-based customers and merchants, by all means, you can leave this as the US country code. But by all means, as I'd shown you today, within our database, I'm actually storing that country code for each shop that is created. And so I know this might sound repetitive, but I do just wanna open up my data tab once again and show you that information. So just to reiterate, every user in our database can create a shop. And we have this data field under our user data type, which is their owned shop. So this is the shop that someone creates. And within that shop, we have a data field known as the country code. And that is just a text field. Now, I do also have a workflow on my page that runs when this update button is clicked for my merchant settings. And within this workflow, I either create a new store or I update the details of an existing store. And within that process, I store the country code. So if I open up my workflow tab, sorry to digress here, but you'll see two additional red workflows. So in this one, I create a new store and I store the country code within that. And of course, that is linked to the drop down menu on my page that I'd already shown you. And then I link that shop back to the user who created it. So their own shop is now the shop that was created in step one of our workflow. And this additional workflow just runs here if someone already has created a store. So instead of creating a new shop, I actually just wanna make changes to their existing shop. Now, I'm sure you've already taken the time to build out workflows that creates a very similar experience in your own application. But as I mentioned, you'll just need to store the country code within your shop. 
because what I want to do is head over to my Stripe workflow here and I actually want to set a dynamic value for this country code. I don't want it to be a static value. So what I'm going to do is choose to insert dynamic data and I'm going to reference the current user. So that is the merchant who is logged in and is wanting to connect their Stripe account. I'm going to reference their owned shop. So that is the shop within our database that they are linked to. And I'm then going to extract the store country code. So that is how I can pull out the relevant country code for their particular store. Now for the email, I'm just going to set this as the current user, their email. That one is super straightforward. But what you'll also now see is that we have the option to set a default payout interval for this merchant. And what a payout interval is, is it just determines how frequently someone's going to receive payments from all the transactions that occur in our marketplace. So let's say you run a store on my marketplace and every day you're getting three sales. And of course, as the owner of that marketplace, I'm going to take, let's say 20% of each sale. But of course that leaves 80% of that transaction that you need to receive as the merchant. And so should you receive that payout daily, weekly, or monthly? Now, I personally prefer to use the weekly interval, but please don't stress because later on, we're going to build out a feature that allows users to actually customize their payout interval to whatever option suits them. The other thing we'll need to update is the weekly anchor. So this will just determine what day of the week they will actually receive that payout. And look, I'm just going to leave that as Monday because the best way to beat your Monday blues is to receive that cash money. So we're going to lighten up everyone's day. Now that is everything we'll need to configure within this step. The next thing we'll need to do though is add an additional step in our workflow. And because we've actually just created a new Stripe Connect account, I'm gonna to wanna to link this to the merchant within my own database. So if we head to our actions, I'm gonna add another step in my workflow and open up my data tab and choose to make changes to an existing thing. Now the type of thing I'd like to change is the current user. So once again, that is the merchant who has logged in and has just connected their own Stripe Connect account. And from here, there's one field I just need to change. It's super straightforward. And that is going to be the Stripe account ID. And I'd like this to equal the result of step one, where we created a new Stripe account, the Stripe account ID. It truly doesn't get simpler than that. And now at this point in our workflow, we've created a new Stripe account for someone. But what I'd like to do is send them through to a dedicated portal where they can actually customize the details of their Stripe account. Now, thankfully that portal is actually gonna be on stripe.com itself, not in our own application. So Stripe's gonna take care of all the heavy lifting for us. And look on that page, a user's just gonna to need to store information about their business. And they can also update the branding of how they want their business to look in Stripe. And of course, any changes they make there are going to reflect how their store looks within the checkout of our own application today. And so what we're gonna do is add an additional step in our workflow. And if we scroll on down to our plugin actions once again, we're gonna select this option to create what's known as an onboarding link. And so as the name would suggest, this is gonna send someone through to that Stripe portal where they can onboard and create their own merchant account. So they can store all of their information about their business, so things like their tax number, as well as things like who runs the company and who's the point of contact for the company. So Stripe's gonna handle all of that messy information for us. Now, what we will need to do is of course configure these three fields. So for the account field, what we're gonna do is reference the Stripe account that was created in step one of our workflow. So if we insert dynamic data, we're gonna reference the result of step one, the Stripe account ID. Doesn't get much simpler than that. And then we'll just need to add in the URL of our application that someone will be redirected back to. Because if we're sending someone through to a Stripe portal, once they've completed the process of onboarding their Stripe account, Stripe would like to send them back to our application and then once they return to our app, they can continue on with their session as per normal. Now there's two fields here. There's the return URL. So that is the URL I've just described where someone's gonna be sent back to our app. We'll take the time to configure this one first. Now by all means, you can customize this URL to whatever page you would like within your app. So if you want your user to be redirected through to a particular landing page in your app, you can add in the URL for that. Now there are a couple of different ways you can source the URL for your application. You could first of all run a preview of your app and let's say grab the URL from the browser here. You could copy that across and you could paste that in. Or if you wanted to do it dynamically, what you could do is select to insert dynamic data. And if you type in the word URL, you can reference this URL here. And what that just means is that when someone's sent through to the Stripe onboarding page, it's just gonna take note of what the exact URL is before someone was sent through to that page. 
And of course, like anything in Bubble, there's more to it than what I've just explained. So if I was to just quickly jump to my design tab and let's put ourselves in our end user's shoes here. So let's say I've just upgraded my account to become a seller or a merchant within this marketplace. I've selected that I wanna connect my own Stripe account. I'm then sent through to that Stripe page where I can add in all of the information for the onboarding of my account. And then Stripe's now going to send me back to this application page. If I was to return to this page, as a user, I'd like some sort of confirmation that my Stripe account was successfully connected. And so what I've done today is I've just created this little pop-up here, which if I just show this at the top of my page, the purpose of this is to just indicate to a user that their account was successfully integrated. Now I'll explain all of the workflows and design behind this pop-up in a moment. So don't stress, you don't need to build this out right now. But I just wanted to mention that because if a user does return to this page, I'm gonna to need to create some sort of way to reference when this pop-up should be displayed. And the way I can do that is by storing some information in a URL parameter. So if I jump back into my workflow here, what we're gonna do is add in a URL parameter at the end of our URL. Now, if you're not familiar with URL parameters by this point, they're just a way of storing data within your URL, so that way you can extract it at any point in time. And the best example of URL parameters is actually within Bubble itself. So within my browser here, if I was to head up to the URL, what you'll notice is that the domain here is bubble.io forward slash page. And then what you'll see is this little question mark followed by a word and then the equal sign. Now this is known as a URL parameter. And so what you'll see is that my URL contains a long string of different text and symbols. And that's because Bubble's storing information about my app inside of it. So for instance, you can see here, there's a URL parameter known as the tab. Now, because I'm in tab two of my editor, so my workflow tab here, you'll see Bubble storing the information saying that I am in tab two. If I was to update this to be, let's say tab three, and then reload my URL, what you'll see is that my editor will load and it's now opened up tab three, so my data tab. And of course, this URL will change at any given point in time based on the information that Bubble wants to store within it. So if I was to open up a different data type here, you can see that my URL changes. And so what I'd like to do today is just store a URL parameter that just determines that when a user is sent back to our page, they have successfully connected their Stripe account. And so if I just jump back into my workflow tab and open up my workflow, what I might do is actually manually build this out. So I know I just said that I was going to make this a dynamic URL, but for the sake of our tutorial, I might show you how to do this manually. So I'm just gonna right click on this and clear this expression. But if I wanted to add a parameter onto the URL of my settings page, what I'm gonna do is open up the preview of this page. I'm gonna grab the URL here and I'm just gonna grab up to the word settings. So anything behind this text is just for our debugger, which is displayed at the bottom of our page. So I just wanna grab all of the information before that. So that's gonna be the name of your application, version test, and then the page that we're viewing. So I'm gonna copy that text I'll jump back into bubble and then I'm going to paste in that value. And if I wanted to add a URL parameter onto this, I'm gonna add in a forward slash followed by a question mark. And for every URL parameter, you need to store two things. Number one, you need to give the parameter a name. And number two, you need to store the information for that parameter. And so to give the parameter a name, you can literally just type in whatever you want. So I'm gonna call my parameter return because this is going to determine if a user is being returned to this page as opposed to just loading this page by themselves. And so that is the name of my parameter, but now I need to give this a value. And so in order to store a value for this, I'm just gonna type in an equal sign. And once again, I can just type in whatever value I'd like. And I'm gonna set that to be the word true. So right now my parameter is return equals true. And if I click away, this is exactly what it should look like. And the reason why I'm storing this parameter is because later on, we're gonna build out a workflow on this page that just recognizes when the URL is loaded with this return equals true parameter, what I'd like to do is display my success pop-up. But of course, I'll be sure to explain that in more detail when we get to it. For now though, I just wanna add a refresh URL. And so a refresh URL is kind of like the return URL, but let's say if a user is sent to our onboarding page and then they refresh the browser or they cancel the experience, at that point, they haven't actually successfully created their Stripe account. So we're actually not returning them with a success message, but instead we're just refreshing the URL of our application. Now I'm just gonna paste in the exact same URL that I copied before. 
So this is the URL of my settings page itself. And look, we've almost finished the process of building out this workflow. There is one last step that I need to create. And that is that I need to actually open up that Stripe portal that we're gonna send the user through to. And this is super straightforward. So what we're gonna do is head to our navigation events, choose to open an external website. And if I insert dynamic data, I'm gonna reference the result of step three, where we created the onboarding link, the URL within that link. And just like that, that is everything we need to include within this particular workflow. What I would like to do while we're here is just click on my workflow trigger and update the event color of this to be blue. So that way I can easily differentiate between what is a Stripe workflow and what is an existing workflow on my settings page. And now we're almost at the point where we can actually preview this whole experience. But before we do that, I do just wanna to touch base on how I've created that pop-up. So that way when you go to run a preview of this, your users will see that success message displayed once they've actually connected their Stripe account. So if I just jump to my design tab, I'm gonna head up to my elements tree and you'll see I've created a pop-up here, which is called my pop-up Stripe success. Now I'm not gonna explain how to create a pop-up from scratch, but of course you can just add a pop-up onto the page. And within this, I literally just have an icon as well as some text. I don't have anything hidden or any conditions on this, but of course you will need to remember that a pop-up is not visible on your page until you reference it within a workflow. And so it's now at this point that we'll need to create the workflow that actually displays this pop-up. And so to do that, we're gonna head over to our workflow tab and we're gonna create a brand new workflow from scratch. And we're gonna trigger this workflow every single time the page is loaded. Only within this workflow, I'm actually gonna create a condition on the workflow trigger that only allows it to run when we have that URL parameter stored inside of the URL itself. So if I just grab the workflow trigger, I'm gonna to head to the condition section and I'm gonna create a condition that just recognizes when the URL parameter. So if I just type in the word URL, you'll see the option to get data from your page URL. And this is where we can now reference the parameter we created. Now my parameter was called the return parameter. Now one thing I should point out is that you're gonna to have to spell this the exact same way as the way you referenced it within your existing workflow. So for instance, if I was to add a capital R here, whereas I hadn't added a capital in my very first workflow, these parameters would not match because they are not the exact same value. So you just need to take the time to double check that they're spelt the exact same. So all lowercase and it's just one word. I just wanted to make a point of that. Now what I'm gonna do is reference when the return URL parameter, when its value is, and then I'm gonna type in the word true. And once again, I'll need to make sure I spell this the exact same way that I'd spelt it when I'd actually created my first workflow. And when this parameter is true, what I'd like to do is show my pop-up. So I'm gonna to head to my element actions, I'll show an element, and that element is of course our pop-up Stripe success. Now, because this workflow is related to our Stripe onboarding experience, I'm gonna select on the workflow trigger and also update its event color to be blue. So now you can see that these two workflows are in fact related. And that is the very last thing we'll need to change when it comes to the workflows that power this experience. Because I do just wanna explain everything in as much detail as I can though, before I run a preview of this, I just wanna highlight how you can customize the onboarding experience within the Stripe portal that I've mentioned. So when someone's sent through to that Stripe portal, you do have the option to add your own custom branding to it. So that way it can be in line with the branding of your marketplace inside of Bubble. Now, by all means, this isn't completely necessary. You can leave this as the standard option, but for those who wanna create a consistent experience, this is gonna be sure to help you. So if you were to just quickly jump over into Stripe here, over in the top right-hand corner, you're gonna see this option to open up your settings page. And under the Stripe Connect menu, you'll see the option here to open up your settings. Now within this, there's a couple of things I should just point out. When it comes to the branding section of your Stripe Connect account, you will just need to make sure you've stored your business name in this. If you don't take the time to fill this out, you might find that you get an error message when someone tries to connect their Stripe account. So I just wanted to point that out. But if you scroll on down, you'll see the option here to view what our onboarding page is gonna look like. And inside of this, you can choose to customize the appearance. So you can upload things like a custom icon, a custom logo. You can change the branding colors as well as the color of the buttons. And so what I might do for the sake of our tutorial today is just upload a custom logo. And look, that's all I'm gonna change for this. 
I'll then scroll on up and just save my branding changes. And of course, if you've made any changes here, you'll also need to do that. And it's now at this point in time, we can finally run a preview of how this whole experience is going to function. So what I'm gonna do is jump back into the preview of my bubble app here, and I'm gonna refresh the page. Now remember, I'm currently logged in as a user, and this user has already upgraded to become a seller. And so now this user has access to create their own store. So I'm just gonna take the time to create this store quickly. I'm gonna call this Emily's Crafts. I can just see I have a small typo there, so I'll fix that. Then I'm going to set her store country code as the US. I'm going to update that information in our database. You'll see that that change was made. And now I'm going to select to connect a Stripe account for this user. So I'm going to select on this button here and it's gonna run our workflows. Now within this workflow, it's not only creating a new Stripe account for this user, but as you'll see, it's now redirecting me through to our onboarding page. And you can see right now that we're currently viewing this in test mode because this is our development version of the onboarding portal. So that's why you'll see things like the email is not needed in your test mode, but you will just need to add in a phone number. And this is what the whole experience is gonna look like for merchants who wanna to connect to your marketplace. So I'm just gonna quickly add in my phone number here. I'll select to continue through the experience and I'll just need to verify that number. And then from here, a user is gonna be required to add in all of the information about their business. Now, if you remember when we were storing the user's country code, I mentioned that everyone's onboarding experience is gonna be different based on the country in which they're located. And this is gonna be the case today. So because my user's country code is the US, they're gonna to have to fill in all of the relevant details for a US business. And so I'm not gonna bore you with all the details. So what I'm gonna do is just skip ahead to the very last step of this process. All right, so as you'll see, we've now finished adding in all of the test details for this particular user. What you will notice though, is I'll just need to add a payout account. So this is the account in which a merchant is going to receive their payouts from our marketplace. And because we're viewing this in the development version of our Stripe app today, I can just choose to add in a test institution here. So that's just gonna add in a fake bank account. We will connect all of that. Then we'll save this here. And that is completely fine. I'll then select an account, scroll on down and continue through our onboarding experience. And if we scroll on down, we can now agree and submit our onboarding form. So when I click on this, it's going to create everything inside of Stripe. And then finally, it's gonna redirect us back through to our main application in which, as you can see, it's sent through our URL parameter here. So this is our return equals true, which means that when the page was loaded with that parameter, our pop-up message had also displayed. So now our test user, Emily here, knows for a fact that her Stripe account was successfully connected. So that's just gonna create a much better end user experience. Now, from an admin standpoint, if you as the owner of your application would like to review which merchants have integrated with your marketplace, what you can do is jump into Stripe here. And if you open up the connect tab, what you can do is scroll on down and you'll see a long list of all of the accounts that have connected to your marketplace. So I can see here, we've got Emily's account that she's just created. And if I was to click on this, I can view all of the details about her total balance, her future payouts, and you'll soon be able to see a long list of all of the transactions that have occurred. So whenever someone buys something from this merchant on our marketplace, we'll be able to see this here. What I would like to do though, is just jump back into my Notion checklist and tick off that we've finished building out all of the features to register a user as a merchant within our marketplace. Now I know this was quite a lengthy section of our course today, but that's because I didn't just wanna show you the workflows you need to build, but I also wanted to take the time to walk you through the user experience you could create in order to build this feature. And of course, throughout that, I also explained how we could customize the onboarding portal within Stripe itself. And then of course, I just shown you how you could view that customer that's just been created within your own Stripe account. And as you can see, there's one very last thing I just wanna cover. And that is that, look, sometimes things don't always go to plan. Sometimes you might find that you get an error message when a customer tries to connect their account to your Stripe marketplace. And look, that's completely fine. A common error you might see when you're connecting a Stripe account is this message known as a B-type definition. So you'll see this error message that says the key error is not part of the B-type definition. And look, I know how frustrating things can be when they don't go to plan. So what I wanted to quickly do before we wrap up this module is just walk you through the process of how you can troubleshoot this yourself. Now I'm gonna add a link to the documentation page for the plugin we're using today. 
And on this, they do mention how to handle the B type definition error. So right here, there is a list of all of these steps you should follow. And so we're gonna walk through these steps here. So that way you've got an extra guide to follow. So if we head over to our Stripe dashboard and select on the developers menu here, if you then scroll on down, you'll see on the right hand side, a list of recent errors. And if you click on this error, what you'll be able to see is an error message that was displayed. And within this, it's going to provide some additional insight as to what has caused that error. In most cases, sometimes it might be that you don't have, let's say the business name to pass through to Stripe or a country code for that matter. So Stripe's gonna be sure to point that out here. So before you freak out and you start to think that the integration is broken, please just take the time to do this. And look, as I mentioned, the documentation page for the plugin is gonna be super helpful throughout that process. So that is the very last thing I just wanted to touch base on within this section of our overall course. And that is all I have time to include within this YouTube video today. As you can see, we've been building for a while and there's still so many features we need to set up when it comes to processing payments with Stripe Connect. If you were interested in building out the rest of this integration, I'd always recommend checking out the full course on my website by hitting the link in the description of this video. Now, while this full course is going to cost you money, I'm confident that it's gonna save you weeks of time having to learn how to build this yourself. So if you ever wanted to launch your application as quickly as possible, then the full course is definitely for you. In the meantime though, if you ever wanted to stay up to date with any additional bubble resources I share, I'd always recommend hitting that subscribe button on my channel so that way you can be the first to know whenever I drop a new video. For now though, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to watch this tutorial and I wish you all of the best on your own no-code journey.